we go again. Okay, fingers crossed. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, share with you some of the journey um, that I've been on over the last couple of decades, I guess, uh, thinking about uh, multi-sensory integration, uh, multi-sensory perception, attention, selection um, in a multi-sensory context, one that for me sort of started 20, 30 years ago looking at hearing and vision and over the years have slowly brought more senses uh, to the table, as it were. First touch, um, and then under uh, the guidance of the food industry, uh, smell and taste and pain as well. Trying to uh, understand flavor perception. Um, and in a way, maybe uh, the hope is, I think, to take ideas and insights from the spatial senses the senses that are easier in some sense to study how they interact, how one influences the other, hearing, vision, and touch, I mean, uh, and look at the rules of integration uh, and some of the explanations um, for behavioral effects, and then think about whether those same explanations apply to the case of flavor integration of the chemical senses of taste, of smell, uh, and of oral somato sensation. And if they do, then hopefully you've got a jump start on understanding uh, the world of flavor perception which is just so difficult to study given that your subjects adapt, they get full up, you've got to make the food, clean up the food, so on and so forth. Much easier to stick somebody in front of a computer screen and give them a thousand trials or, or test them over, over the internet, uh, say. And I think there are insights to be had from the spatial senses for the chemical senses, but also I think there's kind of uh, insights that go back in the other direction as well um, uh, that may change, or at least have changed the way I've thought about uh, multi-sensory integration of hearing, vision, and touch from thinking about the world of uh, flavor. Uh, and that's sort of in the context of a, of a quarter of a century, I guess now, maybe slightly more uh, of this sort of shift from thinking about the senses one by one in isolation, given how complex the brain is, to thinking about their interaction, and that maybe most places we look in the human brain uh, seem to uh, show multi-sensory interactions of one form or, or another. Um, and that maybe to really understand perception, given that perception in most situations involves multiple senses being stimulated, we need to think about things like sensory dominance uh, and other sorts of interaction, um, sometimes not uh, expected interactions between uh, the senses. And this has been sort of captured uh, back in the day from uh, 2004 from these two books from uh, Cross-Modal Space and Cross-Modal Attention, Just Hearing, Vision and Touch, the first handbook of multi-sensory processes from 2004 with... Uh, Gemma Calvert and uh, Barry Stein. And in the 65 chapters, 1,200 pages of that edited volume, you will find but one chapter on flavor. That sort of seems slightly imbalanced uh, on hindsight. Uh, and I'll try and convince you the reasons why I think, even for those who are not interested in the flavor senses, uh, uh, why they should be. And as the years have gone by, uh, of course, more and more books and interest, I think, amongst the young scientists I see, cognitive neuroscientists, in multisensory perception, with new handbooks coming out, with our understandings from the kind of normal adult multisensory integration being extended to the world of development. Uh, There's a book with David Lefkowitz and Andy Bremner uh, from the UK. Um, and through, for my passion, really, is taking those basic insights um, that are being discovered all the time, and then thinking about how to apply them to the real world, uh, to the way the places we live in, the places we eat in, what we eat. Um, it's that kind of ap application of multisensory research. That was kind of captured in this book with uh, Alberto Galacci from 2014, In Touch with the Future, from the basic neuroscience uh, through technology uh, to the future uh, of multisensory uh, perception. OK, so that's some of the background. Um, and really, for me, I kind of got into food. I wouldn't never have got into food because none of my colleagues in psychology or cognitive neuroscience were interested in food. Because it is messy and slow. And it's kind of the lower senses, the chemical senses, the more emotional senses, uh, not really worthy of uh, study. Um, so, or so it seems. Uh, but I think maybe there are great questions to be addressed in food and drink, both psychological, um, neurophysiological, but also philosophical as well because the philosophers, too, have been neglecting to think about flavor, I think, until uh, very recently. And if I just take the three dishes shown uh, here, 
I think there's experiments to be done or having been done that have led to those dishes. On the top left, we have the beetroot and orange jelly from the fat duck, a dish that was served about a decade ago in a restaurant with a chef I'll tell you more about later. Uh, where it looks like the beetroot's on the left, the orange is on the right up there on the top left of the image. But in fact, this is a golden beetroot and a blood red orange. The colors have been reversed and the diners hopefully are misled by their eyes to starting on the wrong side of the plate and then the waiter will come back and say, are you sure you I said start with a beetroot? Um, and maybe you come out of the dining experience learning a bit about how vision influences our food behaviors. Uh, same thing in the bottom left, really, with the, with the kind of classic studies of the expert enologists, uh, wine students in France, in New Zealand, and recently we did it with 200 sommeliers in uh, Barcelona, showing that when you give uh, the, the uh, educated noses a white wine colored artificially with odorless, tasteless food dye, so it looks like a red wine, very often you can trick them into uh, uh, experiencing those red wine aromas, even though what's going into their nose or onto their palate is, in fact, the white wine. And almost, in this case, the more experienced the nose, the taster, the more the color of that wine means to them, the more it's kind of strong the predictions about what that wine will taste like. How old is it? You know, were the grapes over extracted? All of that. Was it a hot summer? All of that can be discerned by the expert palate uh, from the color of the wine. The stronger expectations that can really change the taste uh, perception for consumers. And on the top right, another, another really interesting dish for us from a, a two Michelin star chef, Denis Martin, in Vervey in Switzerland. Um, and this is just a single spoonful. Put in your mouth a uh, little sort of you know, a starter in the restaurant uh, in Switzerland, just near Charlie Chaplin's final home and Nestle headquarters. Uh, but what's really interesting to me is that your brain kind of segregates that flavor experience. It's not just one thing. It is one thing. But your brain kind of segregates it into separate taste sensations. First, kind of the sharp hit of the wasabi, then the fattiness uh, of the tuna, and then the slow melt of the white chocolate thereafter. And how does one go about segregating or integrating separate flavor experiences? Is there anything we can learn from, from, from visual perception, from uh, gestalt perception, that might help the chef to better deliver such intriguing and temporally sequenced flavor experiences? I think there is, um, and that's something that's really kind of, kind of become a consuming passion in the lab in Oxford, um, and with chefs like Joseph, you'll hear more from tomorrow, um, and, and others around the world, thinking about applying multisensory science uh, to the food. Uh, in particular, with the kind of the high-end food in mind, because there are lots of uh, sensory analysis labs for industry, where you might go and you're given, you know, people come in every Monday, and they have the tasting panels, and every Monday morning it's Brussels sprouts, frozen. And you know, how, does, how does the freezing procedure change the taste, the palatability? Monday afternoon it's frozen chicken best. How much fish meal can you feed the chicken until you can taste it on the breast meat? This is real sort of uh, sensory science being applied to food, and there are many people who do that kind of research very well, so best le leave them to it. We're more interested in the kind of the higher end. Formula One of the kitchen, if you like, uh, the more experimental uh, of the chefs who can innovate, I think, much more rapidly uh, than in any other sector that I have seen. And that's why it's so great for me um, that if you can convince a chef like Joseph that something's interesting, then maybe by next week he will put it on the menu. And we'll have real diners paying real money for real food in a naturalistic context. And you can do the experiments uh, right there um, and then. So I think there's a lot of interest from the neuroscience about uh, taking our understanding from the spatial senses to the chemical senses. Uh, and that could go on in a vacuum, in a way were it not for the fact that over the last quarter of a century too, uh, we've seen the rise of molecular gastronomy and modernist uh, cuisine with a growing number of chefs who are saying, the kind of experiences that I want to deliver to my guests, uh, I, I can't do that on the basis of what they taught me at cookery school, if I went to cookery or culinary school. Uh, I need to know more. I need to know more about the brain of the diner. And this is very much what you found at this restaurant here, very close to Oxford, the Fat Duck in Bray, three Michelin stars, uh, formerly the best restaurant in the world, and the chef Heston Blumenthal, who has been collaborating with psychological and cognitive neuroscientists for the last probably 15 to 20 years now, going out to the science labs. He doesn't necessarily understand all the science, but just to see what's going on, what's interesting, and some things will stick, and he'll try and apply them to the food he serves at this world-leading restaurant. And if you were to have gone to his restaurant, uh, as I did for the first time about 2003, 15 years ago or so, then before you got to the menu telling you what you would be eating or what you might be able to choose to eat tonight, 
There was a mission statement, kind of remarkable for its time, I think. Mission statement in a restaurant. It's all about the brain, all about psychology. And it starts thus. Eating is the, is the only thing that we do that involves all of the senses. Maybe we can debate that. I don't think that we realize just how much influence the senses actually have on the way that we process the information from mouth to brain. This in a restaurant, talking about brains. Uh, so many things influence the way that we perceive flavor. Even just the acceptability of food includes a complex process of evaluation. There are basic tastes broken down into subtastes, spicy, metallic, stringent. Uh, then we have mood, emotion, all sorts of stuff, high cognitive functions coming into play and affecting how a diner experiences a meal. And the chef is take, saying that, that's my mission. I go to the labs, I find the best of the neuroscience and the psychological science and try to incorporate it into the dishes that I serve. And maybe when you come out of a restaurant uh, from a chef like Joseph or for, from Heston, you learn a little, little bit more about how your perception works, the integration of the senses, and how it might be used eventually uh, to nudge us towards better uh, food behaviors. And what Heston Blumenthal has been doing in England um, is not, he's not the unique, perhaps before him, for an Adria, another of the world's former number one chefs, again quoted here, saying, cooking is probably the most multi-sensual art. I try to stimulate all the senses, both on and uh, off the plate. So there's the interest there from these world-leading chefs who are setting the stage for all the younger generation. And the question is, what can they find uh, from the psychological science that might be of use to them? And really here, they, I think until recently, they may have hit something of a brick wall. Uh, this quote from 1892 is probably more or less true, it felt to me at least, uh, until a, a few years ago. Uh, that We have William James here saying of the food lover's prized possessions taste, smell, as well as hunger, thirst, nausea, and other so-called common sensations. It tells you right there what they think about these lower base uh, senses. Need not be touched on, as almost nothing of psychological interest is known concerning them. And sort of the same sort of sentiment, in a way, is sort of captured much later by Nicholas Curti, an Oxford uh, physicist, um, whose notes, you know, it seems to me that while scientists on the whole enjoy good food, and they're often expert cooks, they shy away from a serious application of their profession in the kitchen. Could it they be that they do not regard cooking as sufficiently dignified to deserve research effort using scientific techniques and methods? He goes on to say, isn't it strange that we know more about the inside of Mars than we do about the inside of a souffle? Um, but say that against this little lack of knowledge, lack of interest in, in the chemical senses uh, from the psychological uh, and neurosciences against uh, this, one of my favorite quotes from Jay Z. Young in a conference proceeding from 1968. that um, really puts the other position uh, uh, forward, I think. It contains a number of great quotes uh, about the brain and about food and feeding, such as this, that no animal can live uh, without food. Let us then pursue the corollary of this, namely that food is about the most important influence in determining the organization of the brain and the behavior that that brain organization dictates. So even if you're not interested in food, you should be at some level, because that's probably what the brain has evolved to find, forage, uh, and so on, uh, uh, caloric, calorie-dense foods in the environment. And a lot of very recent psychological uh, research would show just how attention-capturing highly uh, calorific foods are to uh, the human uh, brain. Uh, make those highly cal calorific foods move, and suddenly you can explain a lot of the food adverts, supposedly, in the Super Bowl finals, the kind of oozing chocolate cakes, uh, food in motion, high calorie food in motion, yolk porn. Any of you heard of that? No? So, no, if you look it up, um, it really seems to be sort of addictive to our brains. In a way, that I think needs explaining, and that perhaps has been explained by work like this in the bottom right from a study in neuroimage from Wang and uh, colleagues, uh, putting the hungry participants into the brain scanner. Um, and then sh torturing them in a way, showing them their favorite food, assessed by pretest, and not only showing them images of their favorite food, but also taking a Q-tip and rubbing it across their tongues in the scanner. You can see it, you can smell it, you can almost taste it, but not quite. Uh, and they show a 24% increase in cerebral blood flow, far greater than any other kind of stimulus. Real pornography doesn't come onto the scale. But gastroporn, that's what our brain seems to be evolved for. And that sort of maybe it helps to explain why so many of diners, the 30 to 40% in the UK, I don't know what the figure is here, 
who can't help but go out to eat and take a snap of their food before they eat it, shared on their social networks. Maybe it explains the huge growth in the number of food cookery shows on TV and on the networks. We're watching food being made that we probably never make ourselves, but there's clearly something appealing uh, about it. And it may even explain this on the top right, uh, one of my favorite examples of innovative plateware from uh, an Israeli restaurant, I think now closed down, where you can see four that Instagram generation who want to share every meal on the Art of Plating website. Uh, we're going to help you out here uh, by having a little stand for your mobile device so there's no camera wobble uh, on your food porn, and then with the back of the plate curved up so I can guarantee not to get any other diners. Perfect shot uh, every time. Maybe this is the kind of future uh, uh, we're facing if it's true that we eat first with uh, our eyes. And I think there are questions here about the optimal design uh, and presentation of food on the plate that we'll go into more detail with Joseph uh, 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 tomorrow. So these are all reasons to thinking about why the brain might find food particularly attractive. Um, and one might think, okay, if that's the case, then um, uh, who should we look to? What sort of evidence should we look for in order to help advise those chefs delivering that world-class food? built on our understanding of sensory, uh, multisensory perception. Um, and maybe somebody like this, Miguel Sanchez uh, Romero, uh, The Kitchen of the Senses, uh, published in, I think, about 2004. He works just outside Barcelona, friend of Fer Fran Adria, a neurologist by day who had a restaurant by night. If anybody should know about the human brain, maybe he should, and hence he could perhaps use it, incorporate it into delicious tasting food. Open his book. And you find in the first chapter, again, reference to the brain of the diner here, represented by a walnut, connected to the eye, uh, the egg with the olive uh, on top. Sounds good, um, and has convinced some, I think, and led to a whole new world, a whole new field called uh, neurogastronomy. One of the neoglisms, neuro this, neuro that, neuro the other. Um, and popularized by the work of Gordon Shepard over here in the States. Um, and I think there is a lot of, clearly, clearly there's a lot to be learned about flavor perception uh, from neuroimaging studies, from sticking your participants into the brain scanner. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot that's missed, a lot that's missed that is of importance and of relevance to the chef uh, or to everyday food consumption, I think. Uh, and I challenge anyone to tell me that they've had a good, a great, a memorable, the best food experience they ever had lying in the brain scanner with 100 plus decibels of noise with your head clamped while every liquid uh, squirt of food is kind of followed up by a bit of artificial saliva, kind of neutral for your brain. Uh, they don't call it that, of course, because naming's important. Um, so it tells you something, it tells you some important stuff, um, but it doesn't really tell you about those great food experiences, I think. It's clearly not a social experience um, and not a great food one. So perhaps no wonder then that when uh, Miguel Sanchez Romero was bought up by the big money, to, flown out to New York to open the world's first neurogastronomy restaurant, do you think it's going to work? Uh, it didn't. Uh, here reviewed by uh, Franco Bruni, Frank Bruni um, Romero is called in New York City, the world's first neurogastronomy restaurant. Here from his um, I think New York Times uh, uh, review. Its chef, Miguel Sanchez Romero, is a doctor who worked for years as a neurologist. He has coined a whole new genre for his cooking, which favors squishy textures, kaleidoscopic mosaics of vegetable powders, and a wedding's worth of edible flowers. Almost sounds a bit like last night, doesn't it, Jez? <laughs> uh, he, he calls it neurogastronomy, which embodies a holistic approach to food by means of a thoughtful study of the organoleptic properties of each ingredient. Or so says the restaurant's website. Organoleptic, what does that mean? Uh, perceived by a sense organ, I looked it up. Uh, I think like one star, and the restaurant was closed down uh, in, in, in short order. So it's not necessarily so easy, I think, to go directly from uh, uh, the uh, your imaging studies of flavor perception from the neurogastronomy to the real world food, multi-sensory food experience. And it's for that reason, uh, in um, a book from last year, Gastrophysics, uh, I think it looks like this. For some reason, the American publishers wanted to put a synesthetic soup on the top. We tried to stop them, but uh, they couldn't resist. Um, but we should sort of want to think about sort of gastronomy. That's the high end of food I mentioned, the nice food like this dish from Joseph from Kitchen Theory. Uh, pollen and the bee, kind of insect matter, trying to nudge people towards better food behaviors, more sustainable foods, but doing it through beautiful 
presentation, great flavor combination, and maybe a bit of the uh, um, psychology in the background. So it's kind of the gastronomy plus a bit of psychophysics. And clearly trying to do psychophysics uh, in the restaurant with food is going to be a bit more challenging it's going to be a lot harder to give your subjects the thousand plus trials that many a visual psychophysicist uh, would feel more than comfortable with. But I think it's a nice aspiration to sort of systematically look at perception of foods, given a whole range of taste stimuli or environmental factors, and see what influences uh, perception uh, and, more importantly, perhaps memory. And for us to do that both in the science lab, where we can, where we can have highly controlled stimuli, as in the case in the middle bottom here where we have, you know, we're interested in all the stuff almost apart from the food, the glassware, the cutlery, the crockery, the tablecloth, the music, the lighting, the chair you're sitting on, the table you're sitting at. All of these things, I think, subtly influence your uh, meal experience. And in this case, we're interested in the wine glass, because there are people out there, Riedel's of the world, who insist you need to buy a $100 plus glass for each grape variety, and it will really change the experience. But is that true? Is it really worth paying that much money? Will my experience be that much different or better with a specialized glassware? Well, in order to test that scientifically, we have people in the lab, their head clamped again, can't resist it, or they're blindfold with a wine glass agitating on a stand to release the uh, aromas, uh, a bouquet of the wine. And that's very scientific, very highly controlled. It's just not like real wine drinking. This subject, again, is not enjoying what they're tasting. Um, so we'll try and do exactly the same experiments where we can in restaurants, cafes, bars, food festivals, science festivals, music festivals, on street, anywhere we can get people, large numbers of people, and give them some uh, taste experience. That's uh, in the restaurant, highly ecologically valid, but just uncontrolled. How do we know it wasn't because it was raining in Santa Barbara to, last night that we didn't enjoy our food as much as maybe we would have done? It had been sunny, as they told us before we came. Uh, or maybe it's your football team won, something like that. All these factors you can't control that might influence people's responses, um, that can be sometimes yeah, difficult. So try and do research both in the lab and in the real world where possible, and hopefully if you get the same answer in both cases, you can bat aside the critics who say it's not ecologically valid or it's not controlled, well, you've got it in both uh, kind of uh, situations. Uh, so that's all well and uh, good. But what was it, you might ask, what was it originally that got some of these chefs, some of these world-leading chefs, interested in the minds of their diners? Why couldn't they? just focus on the food and what they've been taught, the freshness, the local, the seasonal, uh, put it all together and surely you'll have success. And certainly there are some chefs who think that way. Uh, but I think it's part of sort of modernist cuisine, molecular gastronomy that allows the chefs to pull apart the senses, to have things looking one way but tasting differently. Um, and as such, to give rise to responses like this, here from maybe it's a cross-cultural study, uh, we have some Asian consumers who are clearly, from their facial expressions, not enjoying the taste of whatever it is that is on that bread. We all know what it is? Marmite. It's got to be the Marmite face, love it or hate it. One of these kind of um, uh, 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 divisive foods, especially in the UK. You know, it sort of looks like a Nutella or chocolate, but put it in the wrong context, and I was expecting something sweet and chocolatey. Instead, I got something savoury and salty. Ah! Ah! It's not what I expected, and if it's in my mouth, that could potentially poison me, and hence maybe it's more aversive than disconfirmed expectation out there in the world. And it was just this kind of face that the world's then top chef had his diners in his restaurant pulling when he served this dish. Here at the Fat Duck in Bray, Hester Blumenthal. Uh, and our brains are very good at predicting the energy content and probably the flavor of foods. In this case, most people on seeing this dish will say, probably ice cream, probably raspberry, maybe strawberry. I kind of like it. It's sweet, maybe not so good for me. I'd have to go to the gym. All of that goes through our minds in the blink of an eye. Yet in this case, it's not. In this case, it's a smoked salmon ice cream or a frozen crab bisque ice cream. The color is perfect. It's natural. It's a historic British dish. It's just not what the regular diner expects. So here you have the chef's regular guests in his restaurant being served the new dish for the menu to see whether it, we know it works in the kitchen, does it work in the restaurant, do diners get it? Um, and in this case, the loyal customer's going, oh, that's way too salty, I really don't like it. What's, what's happened to the chef? Is the world's top chef? Has he lost his palate? What's going on here? But no, it's all about uh, telling you that 
kind of the pleasures of the table, in this and many other cases, I think, reside mostly in the mind and not in the mouth. It's about the expectations we have. The chef knew this was a savory, historic dish. The diners did not. They hence experienced disconfirmed expectation. They thought the dish was salty at the time, and even weeks later, they're less likely to try it again, even though they know now what it is. That first exposure seems to set subsequent behavior. The solution in this case from work from Martin Yeomans in the psychology department in Sussex is to, to when the dish comes out, call it food 386. A dish that, what does that mean? Like space food or something? It definitely tells you it can't just be strawberry ice cream, or else why would they call it that? Or call it a savory historic ice, and when you then taste exactly the same food, it tastes delicious, it tastes perfectly seasoned, it tastes as the, as the chef intended, and that switch is all kind of in the mind rather than in the mouth. And that's what this suggests, even if you're the world's best chef, unless you know what your diners are thinking or expecting, you can't guarantee how they'll respond. What tastes good to you may not taste good to them. And hence one needs to figure out what are the kinds of expectations that are set by foods, uh, and that's maybe where the psychologist comes in. In some of the work we've been going around the world, and here from the Science Museum in London, we had 60,000 people come in either to the Science Museum uh, or online uh, to the website and take part in 27 food-related experiments that we could do audio-visually, the sound of food, uh, the sight of food. This was just one of the studies where we had people showing them drinks and asking them, what do you expect? Which of those drinks looks the sweetest? And for the majority of those participants, it's the red one down on the bottom right that looks sweetest. Blue on the top left comes in, in sort of second place with those 50, 60, 70,000 participants in total. Uh, and for this particular study, about 5,300, we can see regardless of the continent from which the subject came, uh, uh, sweetness is, sweetest color is red, regardless of, of your background. Uh, it varies a bit, uh, but it's the same. And then that might be a suggestion for the chef then, if you're trying to set expectations of sweetness in a dish, go for that pinkish uh, red color. If you're trying to set expectations of sour, a bitter, of salty, of this, that, or the other, um, then um, we've got the background data for you. Things that will work cross-culturally and those that will not. Um, and that's one of the sort of the projects we've been working on with Chef Joseph uh, that we'll come back to tomorrow to explain how he created a dish based on those color taste uh, associations. Um, but it goes beyond that in a way that I said I'm really interested in the everything else apart from the food that influences the food experience. And one of the more bizarre ones that, that came our way was with work with Ferran Adria and his Alicia Foundation in Spain, just outside Barcelona, where we did a study in 2011, uh, published in 2012, with what looks like strawberry ice cream, and in this case is strawberry ice cream. Same batch of ice cream served on a black or a white plate to the same people in counterbalanced order in their test restaurant, about 64 participants in total. We asked people how sweet does the ice cream taste, how flavorful, how much do you like it, maybe how much you would pay for the ice cream. Uh, and it turns out that one of those plates makes the dessert look and taste sweeter. White plate. About a 7% sweeter, 13% more flavorful, 9% more liked, and is within subject study by the color of the plate. So while you can't literally taste the plate, the plate on which that food comes influences your expectations, your experience of food. Is it through color contrast? Is it through sort of statistics of your prior food experience that most sweet foods come on white plates, savories, the cheese come on black slates? Uh, we don't know as yet. But in the intervening seven years, we just published a review, and now there are about a 40 uh, peer-reviewed studies from around the world, from Greenland, from Taiwan, with tofu, with cheesecake, with all manner of food, suggesting that the color of the plate changes uh, taste, ratings, and liking. And work from Turkey showing uh, short long-term effects over a month that you can modify people's consumption simply by changing the color of the plate uh, that they uh, eat from. Seems to be that, but the evidence seems to be stacking up um, the plate color matters. And as the, in the rest of the world now, we're moving away from that large white American plate, as it's called, uh, great for sort of plating of an art on the plate. In the UK, there's a lot more texture, color, a lot more sort of Asian-inspired earthenware plates. Uh, I think there's a lot more room to play in this space. And to come out with things like this, which just was launched in March this year, the world's first uh, gastrophysics-inspired plateware range from Neff Kitchens, uh, made by a pottery maker. So we're talking about the border of design and, uh, and the science here. Three plates, um, 
designed based on all the research that had been published until uh, March of this, or to Christmas of, of, of last year. We have the sort of blue and white water or waves or river like seafood uh, fish plate on 